Hi, everyone. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Carrie and Austin back for more. Where we're talking all things, all animals. Happy New Year, Carrie. Yeah, happy 2021. I think we're so happy to have 2020 over with and yet 2021. Wow. Let's see what happens here. We'll see. We're, we'll, be, we'll be in for a ride. Yeah, 2020 is in the back mirror and we have uh, uh, exciting conversation, exciting episodes ahead. Um, and for all of our animal advocates wondering how the political process helps to protect animals, we are we have a very exciting uh, show and guests. We're joined today by Andy Bernat, Senior Director of Policy for the State Affairs Department at the Humane Society of the United States. Thank you so much for sitting down to chat with us today, Andy. We are so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thanks for having me and covering this very important topic. It is, it is very, very important. Uh, and, and so for our listeners, Andy, they who might not be familiar with our legislative work, can you talk a bit about the importance of state legislation passing animal protection laws when it comes to helping animals? Sure. So, um, so at uh, the Humane Society of the United States, we have um, an entire department dedicated to working on state legislative work. We also have an entire department dedicated to working on federal issues. Um, at the state level, it's it's very important. There are for two reasons. There are um, certain issues that can only be addressed at the state level because of the Constitution, our U.S. Constitution, uh, the Commerce Clause. Um, it's a state's rights issue where basically the federal government can only regulate something if there is an element of interstate transport in there. So most of the issues in our regular day-to-day -day lives are regulated by the state and local government. Education, transportation, taxes, um, state crimes, and that would include um, things like animal cruelty crimes, um, wildlife issues. <clears throat> so it, it's, while it doesn't get a lot of the uh, media attention, perhaps, that, that Congress does, it's, it's really, really um, probably more impactful in your day-to-day -day life, the state-level work, than, um, than the federal work. And of course, for uh, working for, for animal protection, Again, there are some issues that we have to address at the state level. We can't um, address at the federal level. And, for th and the, second, uh, the second reason why it's so important is because you have a lot more access to your state and local lawmakers than you do at the federal level. If you go to a state capitol, um, it, you know, and I'm speaking in a, a post-COVID world where you can you know, physically go into the state capitol, um, and you schedule a meeting with your elected official, you'll meet with the actual um, elected official. You won't meet with staff. And um, even now, in a during a COVID world where a lot of the state sessions are remote, um, if you were to set up a, um, a legislative meeting as a constituent with one of your elected officials, you'll most likely um, have a Zoom call with that elected official. Um, at the federal level, it's much more um, staff that, that deals directly with constituents. Mm. So, Andy, one of the things I would be really curious about is, you know, you mentioned that you have sort of two different um, groups, uh, you know, who work on federal affairs versus state affairs. How do you guys coordinate? Because I imagine there may be there may be times when you're trying to work on legislation that may have, you know, ramifications both, you know, at the top and then through the states. Right. So, um, you know, one one thing that we work on is uh, we do try to be very strategic, and um, there's a huge volume of bills at the state and federal level. There's probably 300,000 bills that are introduced a year at the state level. So we have to be really strategic and, and work as part of a long-term strategy. So for example, I can give you two examples. One is the pet store issue where um, we work, we, we can start at the county, at the locality level, the very smallest level of government. Um, New Jersey has passed over 100 ordinances to restrict the sale of puppies from puppy mills in the state of New Jersey which has us very well poised to do a state bill in New Jersey, because if we're getting pushback from some of the legislators, we can say, you know, the constituents in your district have already spoken on this and it, you can't sell, you know, puppies from pet stores in your district. And it makes it a lot easier for them to support a state bill. So then similarly, similarly, when, um, when a state passes something, it can make it easier for those members of Congress that represent that mm. state to, then supported at the federal level. And one of the issues that we're working on at the federal level is the um, uh, prohibiting the um, testing of animals on cosmetics. 
Mm -hmm. And um, that really is something that, for the most part, is a federal issue because the federal government um, regulates um, cosmetic testing and toxicity testing and things like that. But we have a number of states that are passing bills that say you can't do this testing in our state and you can't sell products um, from cosmetics that were tested on animals in this state. And that is a good buildup to eventually get a federal bill passed that will apply to the whole country. Um, and we try to be strategic target states where perhaps um, a committee chair in the federal government is, or you know, a key, key member of Congress who we need their support. If we can, if our federal affairs team can back it up by saying, hey, your state, your constituents already spoke on this and passed this in your state, makes it a lot easier um, to get that member of Congress to support it. Yeah, yeah, I think that this is, I, I really appreciate the explanation, Andy, because my, <laughs> it actually seems like a lot of state bills are more accessible, you know, uh, 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 you know, first steps into a, a long term strategy for a potential for a, a federal bill to pass. Uh, and again, I'm just going to preface this saying a lot of my knowledge has come from like schoolhouse rock of like, I'm just a bill. So I'm really glad that I we, we have a better understanding of how accessible state legislation really can be and how strategic um, you are, because an idea taken all the way to a bill being passed where it might die in a committee or might, you know, there's so many steps that go into this. And it's really good to hear kind of the process that you go through. You know, and I'll add that um, you don't necessarily have to pass a federal bill or pass a bill in every state to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So, you know, we worked for years on uh, the uh, Wild Animal Acts and Ringling Brothers was, you know, our, our biggest opponent on that. They were definitely the, the loudest voice in support of that. And they cited uh, some of the ordinances, the local ordinances that we worked on as one of the reasons why they decided to completely shut down. And by passing ordinances that prohibited uh, the use of bull hooks, which they would use to, to beat the elephants, in key cities, for example, Los Angeles, where their show went, where their traveling show went, it was able to disrupt their business plan essentially to the point where they kind of saw the writing on the wall and they decided to um, just close up shop. Now there are mm -hmm. other, there are other um, entities out there that, that do wild animal acts. So it's not that the issue is resolved completely, but, um, and we're working in states on that issue, but definitely the biggest player you know on this issue is is no longer in business and that was a really smart strategy that that we used and and quite frankly that ringling acknowledged mm. that we used where um you know accessing the local level is really really easy and we were able to do that um and shut down you know a multi-million dollar corporation that was abusing animals so it's really interesting because I think a lot of people, a lot of people would think as sort of legislation and, and laws as something that kind of trickles down, but it sounds like a lot of the times we're almost trickling things up. Yeah. If, yeah. And we, we try to look, where can we get the best bang for our buck? Mm -hmm. You know, where can we, you know, obviously by picking uh, Los Angeles for the Wild Animal Act um, ordinances, I, I mean, you know, Los Angeles is not the same as passing an ordinance in, you know, a very small community. So I, I'm not... I don't want to suggest that it was just a piece of cake, but it was a lot easier than doing it at the state level or the federal level. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for Ringling to not be, for any uh, circus to, that uses wild animals to not be able to go into Los Angeles is um, detrimental to, to their, you know, they have all these travel uh, requirements and everything. So, you know, looking at other issues, the sale of uh, dogs and pet stores, the sale of fur, you know, we can look at, um, localities where it's really prevalent and where it's really happening and target those um, and sort of shut down uh, some of these abusive industries where they're really prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, so being smart with where we, um, where we work on these issues is a big part of it too. So Andy, if we're still talking about similarities between federal and state level, I know that federal level, federal lobbying is so important to the relationship of, of potentially getting these laws passed and legislation passed. How much work is building relationships with state officials? It's like I said before, it is it, your state elected officials for the most part are very accessible. Um, I always talk about my, um, my delegate is um, his son is in my son's class. So I see him at PTA meetings or, you know, on Valentine's Day when we're there volunteering. And um, so, I, you know, and I have a friendly relationship with him and he's completely accessible. Um, they're not uh, sort of news celebrities as much as members of Congress are. So um, 
they, you know, they could live in your neighborhood and you don't even know it. Um, they want, I would, I really would say 95% of state and local elected officials, they want to hear from their constituents. I think that um, this, um, you know, they're all crooks or, you know, this kind of like, you know, a conception that all elected officials are sort of in it for themselves. I don't believe that's true. Um, I've met a lot of, uh, a lot of elected officials at the state and local le level who they want to do right by their constituents. They're in it because they want to pass law. They're not, um, you know, they're not getting their, their issues showcased on CNN. They're just there doing like the nitty gritty work. And I think that because of that at the state level, we do see it, it's, a, it's, it's functioning better than at the federal level, just because there isn't a big giant spotlight on everything they do. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they can actually just get to the task at hand and pass laws and work through it and compromise and meet. Um, state sessions are sh typically shorter than a, a congressional session. So Congress, each Congress meets for two years. At the state level, um, it varies. Um, there are a few states that are two years, but um, there are some that are only 30 days. Um, it's probably about four or six months is the average length of a session. So when a bill is introduced and, and you know, the, the legislators really want to make it happen, they don't have two years to sit around, you know, and, and think about it. They have to get it done. And, two months, four months, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, they're in there moving things along, working because they're on a deadline. And when the session ends, you have to start over. So even if you pass the Senate in 2020, if the bill dies, you have to, in 2021, you have to start all over again from the very beginning. So wow. they're very motivated, I think, to, if they want to get something accomplished, they're very motivated by, by timing and just their sort of ability to work together to really get it done. Um, so hearing from their constituents is extremely important, is very important. It, it truly, truly is. So Andy, I would imagine that that speed that some of this happens with can be like a good thing and a bad thing for us. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, I mean, I know some of your work involves like getting in and fighting when a bad bill is introduced. And maybe you yeah. could give us like a hypothetical, like I think a lot of people would be surprised to think that, to, to th think that anyone's out there kind of introducing legislation that would hurt animals, but it's something right. you deal with all the time, right? So we have, uh, we have state directors on the ground in the Capitol um, or remotely in the Capitol, mm. if, uh, <laughs> if that's the case, um, in most states. And that's really critical because they are, they are there every day. It's their full-time job. They know the process, the procedure, the rules, the hearings, um, the dates, the deadlines. Those are all critical because uh, most bills die. You know? So that means they're introduced, nothing happens. They die at the end of the session. Um, so really understanding the process is, is critical. Um, of course, our opponents really understand the process as well. So, um, <laughs> right, right. you know, we have that. Um, I think on when you ask, you know, why, I, I hear that a lot. Why would anybody, you know, want to hurt an animal? Why would anybody, mm -hmm. you know, be, you know, for, for animal cruelty? And there are a lot of industries that um, are profiting from inhumane practices um, mm -hmm. towards animals. And, um, in some of these industries, we've seen good change. We've seen them want to work with the humane uh, organizations to change their business practices, but some of them are um, a little reluctant to change some of that. And so when um, you know, a state legislature is asking them to do that, they, uh, you know, they can sometimes have issues with that. So yeah. our opponents are a lot of time, um, you know, the industries that use animals um, and they do this, I'll tell you, their, their, their biggest tactic right now that they use is, is because they cannot win on the merits of the issue. It's very hard to defend some of the things they're doing. It's very hard to defend keeping a, a pregnant sow in a, in a crate in a, for, for her whole entire life. It's, it's, I mean, it's really hard to defend animal fighting. Yeah. I mean, there are things that just really are, you can't defend. So they know that they will lose on the merits of the issue. And what now, what we're seeing in the past five years, the trend is to attack the process for us. So hmm. they try to say that um, you, can't, um, f you can't film um, abusive practices uh, in certain industries. Hmm. And this is of course how a lot of the cruelty is exposed. Yeah, the they, ag egg stuff. Yeah, the ag egg stuff. Hmm. They try to um, you know, say that uh, any ballot measures on wildlife issues need to pass by our higher majority. They, um, they try to restrict what localities can do. They say, you know, things that involve animals, only the state legislature can deal with. You can't deal with that at the local level. And so we're seeing them attack the process instead of attacking on the merits because they can't win on the merits. Mm -hmm. So um, 
every single year, you know, in a, in a good number of states, we're in there fighting to um, just keep the dem democratic process available to animal advocates to, to make our case. And, you know, then, a, then an elected official can vote on, you know, on the merits of the issue. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, because I love the accessibility aspect of uh, talking to your state legislators, when it comes to a very, um, a process that we're very proud of, Humane Lobby Days, can we talk a little bit about how we can start as as the constituent a relationship with our state legislator? Sure. So um, I would first, I would advise everyone to find out who your state and local elected officials are and federal. Um, and I would... Um, find their Twitter page, their Facebook page, all of their social media, follow it, like it, um, be able to access it and see it. Um, get their phone numbers, their emails. Um, I think that in terms of what is the most effective way to communicate and start a relationship with your legislators, obviously a one-on-one -on -one or you know, an in-face personal meeting with a small group is the best, most ideal way. This is, is uh, where Lobby Day comes in because we help set up appointments for our attendees of Lobby Day to meet directly with their legislator at the state level. So they sit down, they meet them, they talk, they are from the same district, they have things in common, they know the same high schools and churches and things like that. And then you can start going into the bills you care about, you're, you're a voter, you're a constituent, you really want you know, your elected official to do right by animals. Um, a lot of our Lobby Days are remote, which um, is, is fine because um, a lot of our opponents' lobby days will have to be remote. So we're kind of all, you know, on an even playing field for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll still, just like uh, we're, we're all three talking right now, you will talk with your, your elected official on Zoom, you see their face, um, talk about the high school and the church's things you have in common, let them know that you are a constituent, you care about animals. Um, and then I really advise to follow up with uh, email or a phone call a lot of the, especially the newer elected officials are really um, aware of social media. And so, you know, mm -hmm. for example, if you like their Facebook page, then you can write a comment on there. Thank you, Senator Smith, for meeting with me today on animal protection issues. I look forward to your support on Senate Bill 101 to make, you know, animal cruelty a felony, um, whatever the issue is, because your legislator's seeing that, but so is everybody else. So it's a very, you know, and we always, of course, want to be very polite, courteous, um, respectful, but, um, and I encourage people to follow up, continue, you should have a relationship with your state and local officials, of course, for animal issues, but for other issues that you care about. I mean, for, for you know, they are there to represent you and they are determining a lot of things that are, will affect your day-to-day -day life. So uh, it's a really important relationship to have. And um, it's not like at the federal level where they just have tons and tons of constituents in an entire state you know, it, it, because it's so much smaller, they remember a lot of people. And if you mm -hmm. continue to have a relationship, if you go to their town halls and communicate with them, they're going to start to remember you and they're going to start to respect your opinion. And they're going to really start to look to you when animal issues come up and say, oh, you know, I want to make sure that my constituent, you know, is okay with the way I vote. So, I mean, it's really true that these relationships you form will have a, a, a direct impact on, on animal protection laws and, and uh, the laws that affect your life. Yeah. And they'll pay off down the road, too, because, you know, you're going to have that relationship with the state legislator. Potentially, some might move to higher offices. And, and yeah, so only only benefits from there. That makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, Barack Obama was a state legislator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Case in point. Andy, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I mean, obviously, you've been doing this for a while and you obviously have a lot of confidence in your ability to go in there and talk to you, to talk to legislators. I think that a lot of people who are sort of just starting, like they would be nervous about it. And so one of the things I'd love to hear from you is how you got into it and how you kind of developed the confidence to, to feel good about going in and approaching a local legislator in a way that feels human, but also gets the work done. Sure. So I think, you know, make the first step. Go ahead and make the first step. Um, you can look on uh, our, our website and find your state director, or you can always email your state director if you don't know who that is. It, it would you would just be your state at humanesociety.org. So Maryland at humanesociety.org, Virginia at humanesociety.org. Contact your state director to um, get set for Humane Lobby Day. They will help you. You will be with other people in your community who this is the first time they're doing this, or maybe this is the tenth time they're doing this. Mm -hmm. I think you have to, you know, make that first step, do it the first time, and you will see um, it is it is not a negative experience. Even yeah, if it's they a don't bite. 
Most they of them don't, don't bite. bite. Most. <laughs> Even if <laughs> well, they, they won't bite a constituent. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, even if your legislators aren't great on animal issues or aren't necessarily the party that you affiliate with, you're a constituent. They are mm -hmm. going to want to hear from you. They're going to want to be respectful. They're going to be nice to you. They really are. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have never heard, I really have not heard of it. I don't can't think of any example when a constituent met with a state legislator and they were like, mean or disrespectful mm. they might say you know respectfully i disagree or they might completely lie to you um <laughs> and vote the wrong way but there's nothing to be afraid of they want to yeah. hear from you they need to hear from you um and if they don't hear from us then how do they, they maybe they don't even realize that you know a bill they're voting on has a, a really detrimental impact so it's it's very important mm. right so what pieces of legislation are we focusing on uh for the future andy we have a number of priority issues that we work on. Um, I've mentioned a few of them. Um, the intensive confinement of farm animals, the um, sale of uh, puppies from pet stores uh, that are from, pe from puppy mills, um, cosmetic testing of animals, trophy hunting, uh, contest kills, a lot of the captive wildlife issues and um, uh, wildlife traveling acts are big priorities and we will see a good number of bills on those issues in 2021 in states. Uh, most state, states are just starting their sessions now. So, um, you know, check in, keep keep in touch with your state director and they'll let you know when these bills are introduced and when uh, they'll get hearings and when you can, can really act on them. Um, and uh, we do expect a, a full, robust animal protection agenda at the state level this year, despite a lot of the challenges that 2021 or 2020 brought. You know, I guess my last note would be to really please um, Look up who your state officials are. You can do that on our website too. Uh, your state, local, and federal. Um, like all of their social media, follow all their social media, send them an email that says, I'm a constituent, I care about animals, I look forward to working with you in 2021 and, and your support for animals, no matter what, even if they're you know not your favorite person, they, that's, this is still your elected official. Um, mm -hmm. And continue with that relationship. It's really about having that long-term relationship that will that will be impactful. And contact the state director, and you'll get notified of when uh, the animal bills really need to hear the the legislators really need to hear on an animal bill because a, an action is about to be taken. Thank you so much, Andy Bernat, uh, Senior Director of Policy for the State Affairs Department at the Humane Society of the United States. We really, really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you again so much. Um, and that's all we have for today's show. To find out more how the political process helps to protect animals, you know where to find us, humanesociety.org. Thanks for tuning in, and see you next time on Humane Voices.